evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There's the ones who's going to come forth. It's going to be the good and the bad. It's going to be the just and the unjust. And the hour that that will happen, or the period of time in which that will happen, will be, you know, reunited in, in, a, in close unity and perspective. And it's going to be at the last day when Jesus returns. But... Someone says, though, okay, would you help me then understand the terminology in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16? Why is it said uh, that the dead in Christ will rise first, you know, leaving you with the idea that maybe and setting you in the direction of a path that would give you the idea that, that later on, you know, along down the way, there will be some others resurrected. Here's what we got to understand. Those words in 1 Thessalonians 4, the terminology, please understand, was spoken for the benefit of the children of God. They had a concern. And their concern was about some who had passed away, who were God's people as well, and they loved them. Uh, they didn't understand everything, so, so, so they needed some understanding. Uh, they needed some enlightenment. Uh, they needed uh, consoling. They, they needed comfort. And this is exactly what they received from the inspired words of Paul. But please understand, he's addressing children of God who's interested in these children of God who has died that they loved. And so here's what God said to them. And of course I'm paraphrasing this. He said, you can know that they are all right. And they're going to be all right. Because here's what it's going to be. A thus saith the Lord, the message is from me. And right here, here is the message. Here's the way it's going to be. You who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And again, who are children of God. In other words, you're not going to get the jump on them. <laughs> you have no advantage over them whatsoever. You're not even going to hurt them in any way. I want you to understand that. The dead... And this is, where, this is when he makes his statement, and I, I can understand why he makes it. The dead in Christ will rise first. So here you are, you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about them, and you love them because they're children of God too. You want to understand that they're okay. And so he lets these children of God know that they'll be okay. They will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain, who are children of God, are going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And right after saying that, he said, comfort one another with these words. He gave them some consolation. He gave them some consolation. A child of God... And so you can, be, you can be happy that you're a child of God tonight. If that is the case, a child of God is going to be looked after. But there's going to be some order to it. There's going to be some decency of action in regard to that. And, uh, of course, the dating Christ will rise first. And then special attention then will also be given to those of you who remain. Now, you know, when you read this, wouldn't that or would that not want to make you, wouldn't that, wouldn't that cause you to want to be a child of God? Wow. No question about it. Okay, tonight we're looking at Jesus' purpose for returning, things that he will be doing 
And another of the things that is going to be an action on his part will be, and I like this one. I like that first one, but I like this one too. The world will be destroyed. <laughs> you say, Mike, how can you be positive about that? I live in the world. But it's going to be destroyed, and it's going to be a time of unparalleled destruction. Nothing ever like it before. And I can understand why Jesus is going to do that. First of all, you'll remember he said that I am the Alpha and the Omega in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. Uh, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, the Omega, is going to come. And it's going to be Him who's going to bring an end and be the concluder of this world. Think about it. He's going to wrap it all up. He's going to finish it off and put an end to this world. And you know what I say to that? Of course, with understanding, but I say, Amen. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that day. Because you know what, what this world is? I want to share with you some passages of Scripture uh, that will help us to understand that when He does that, He is doing us a favor who are God's children. He's doing us, maybe not some of the others, but He's doing us a favor. Because you go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, and it talks about the world and how it lies under the sway of the wicked one. I don't really want any part of it. In Mark 8, you'll remember that Jesus calls it adulterous and sinful. Remember that? And he said, whosoever is ashamed of me in this kind of a world, when I return, I'll be ashamed of him. Oh, yes, and the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 said, this world is perverse. This world is crooked. And I think that every one of us tonight has lived long enough in this world that we know that's so. Except for the righteous impact that's in the world from those who love Jesus. You go to Galatians chapter 1, and Paul calls it evil. And the Apostle Peter says that it is a world of corruption and just filled with all kinds of desires that are wrong. And oh, yes, there's 1 John chapter 2. You remember what the Apostle John said about this world? The things that's in this world are not of the Father, but are of the world. And if you love the world and the things that are in it, you are not of the Father. And we know what those things are. You could tell me. Lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life, arrogance, which causes people not to submit to the Lord. Yes, the things of the world are not of the Father. And in 1 John 2 and verse 17, it says it will pass away and is passing away. It's lust, but he who does the will of the Father abides forever. So let's go with that in mind to 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Here is where the Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which... Now here's what's going to take place. Here's where we hear it. Jesus comes, and the Bible says, The heavens will pass away with a great noise. I've never seen that before, but we're going to. You just look up the heavens, 
whatever you see is going to pass away with a great noise. You look up there, you're going to see the sun, you're going to see the moon, you're going to see the stars. It's going to go by the power of the Lord. Peter also says the elements will melt with intense heat. The building blocks of our universe. And then get this, finally, both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. So you just stop and you think about some of the natural wonders of the world. You stop and you think about everything that man has done and contributed to this world and building it up, his achievements and his doings and his ingenuity and his abilities and the skyscrapers and everything else you see is going to burn up. Verse 11 says, all these things will be dissolved. The Lord's going to do it. And personally, I'll be glad. Because, you know, we just read a moment ago where the children of God are going to go, didn't we? Going to meet the Lord in the air. To be with Him forever, 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 and forever. Well, anyway, Peter says, since that's the case, then it's interesting to me that he reminds us of living right. That makes sense, doesn't it? If the Lord is going to do that to a world that's not nice, then there's got to be somebody who lives in the world that is opposite of that, right? And so this is the very verse, verse 11 is the verse where you find the question that was raised, what manner of persons ought you to be? And you look at that verse and you'll see holy living is mentioned and godliness. You read verse 12, well, it just says what has already been said in the, in the verse 10. So you have a little bit of a, a reinforcement of what's already been said. I think it's quite interesting what is said in verse 13. Now, now, now keep in mind what Peter has said, <laughs> and, and think about the reaction that you'll get from, you know, people. And right after saying that, he says, Nevertheless, we according to His promise, now this is the child of God, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. No, it's not going to be good for everybody. It's going to be a day filled with darkness. But wow, if we are that faithful child of God, it's going to be a beautiful day moment. And so you read this verse, and I begin to think, no wonder we look for the coming of the day of God. And, and, and Peter says, we even hasten its coming. And I've looked at that kind of like, uh, as a child of God, you encourage that, you know, because we're not dreading it. And, and while we're still living in this evil world, we pray for that, right? And we wait for it, and we watch for it, and we desperately want it. And we, we have everything we need uh, uh, that, that, that God would want us to have. We're patient, and we're eager about it, and showing strong faith. I want to tell you something. When you look for Him... And, and, I, and I mean, you really look for Him and for His return. You're going to have a whole entire different perspective than ever before. The things of this world, everything that's in it, that to so many seemingly is the most important. All of a sudden, for a child of God, it takes a back seat. It just isn't 
what it used to be. And why should it be? All of a sudden we realize that our citizenship is in heaven. And, and what we know now is only temporary, and uh, there's going to be an end to it. It's going to all vanish. No wonder our perspective is different. I believe someone has well said, hold with light fingers the things of the world. You agree with that? Don't put your roots too deep down here. Because I want to tell you, I don't care how deep they are, they will be pulled up. Remember what Paul wrote to Timothy? A good reminder, we brought nothing into this world, and we will take nothing out of it. And so with food and raiment, just be happy. Be content. Know that you have what you really need. All right. Now, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to destroy this world. <clears throat> is my time doing okay? Okay. I would like to mention one thing about premillennialist teaching uh, that is able to be seen in, in 2 Peter 3, uh, a mistake, an error that they make. I look at it like, like a problem that they have because Jesus is coming back and this world is going to be destroyed. Well, if, they, if it's going to be destroyed... And, and we're caught up together with him in the air, not anywhere here on earth, and the earth is no more. You know what that means? It means that he's not going to reign that thousand years on earth that they propagate. I think that's a good point. And by the way, Michael uh, is, uh, I believe, just beginning sort of, or wrapping up uh, into time ideas and what is taught and some, some of, his, of the errors that is taught. So you just, you just stay with him. He'll bring it to you. He'll bring it to you. Okay, so Jesus is going to raise the dead and he's going to destroy the world. And there's uh, something else I would like to mention. All will be judged. Every human being <laughs> we'll be judged. And we're going to ask a series of questions just here. And the question, first of all, is who will be our judge? And I think you know the answer already. Jesus is the one that's going to fulfill that role. And uh, I'm glad he is because he's the only one that not only has the capability, but the right to do so. And we'll, we'll see more about that in just a moment. Paul said in Acts 17, verse 31, uh, talking about God the Father, he said, He will judge the world in righteousness, but right after that it says, by that man, that individual whom he has ordained for that. And he's given assurance unto all men in that he has raised this one from the dead. So God will judge through the man that he raised from the dead. And of course we know tonight that that is Jesus. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The same thing is mentioned in Romans 14.10. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Christ is the judge of the living and the dead, and will be that at his appearing. So it is quite evident that the actual judging is going to be done by the person of Jesus Christ.
Christ. Second question. Why is Jesus to do the judging? An interesting question. And in John chapter 5, particularly around the area of verses 22 and 27 and so forth, uh, we get the answer. Jesus said, the Father judges no one. All judgment has been placed in the hands of the Son, and he has, given, he has given him authority to execute judgment. Now get this, because he is the Son of Man. Interesting, right? Jesus is fully, completely, 100% God, but he was also 100% man. That's why the Bible says that he took on the form of a bondservant and he became in the likeness of men so that he could be for us what we needed. So you think about Jesus. Here is one who could understand from the viewpoint of deity. And here is one who could understand from the viewpoint of humanity. We needed that. And incidentally, that explains, does it not, the reason why Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. Yes, that explains why he is our advocate, our go-between. That, 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 that explains why he is, ever lives and makes intercession for us. He is the one, brethren, that has been here He's had that first-hand experience. He knows what it is like. I wouldn't want anyone else judging me. And not only did he have that first-hand experience, but he knows every single one of us. He understands every single one of us. He knows our hearts and our attitudes. In other words, short, he can properly represent us. And I want to tell you this, he is not going to make any mistakes. The judgment that he puts out is going to be absolutely infallible and correct, 100%. Uh, th there will not be any miscarriage of ju justice. There will not be someone who should be here, but they ended up there. It's going to be right. We will receive the proper verdict. In John 5 and verse 30, Jesus said, My judgment is righteous. So again, I think about Jesus coming back. <laughs> I needed him when he first came, and I need him when he comes again. The living and the dead will be judged, all mankind will. The small and the great, the saved and the unsaved, the nations, the cities. And I can just see someone, you know, thinking about a nation or a city, you know, and <laughs> thinking about, well, boy, you know what? That nation is made up of a, a pretty large population of people. Maybe, just maybe, I somehow, maybe I can. Oh, forgive me, brethren. I had a senior moment. <laughs> I do have those. Maybe I can get lost in the shuffle. I just simply say to that, think again. We're going to be in, uh, judged as individuals. I want to share with you what Solomon wrote as he wrote concerning a young man or, or youth. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, he said, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth, and walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But no that all these 
for all of these, God will bring you into judgment. Solomon talking to the young, and he's telling them, okay, you have a good time, enjoy life, but you be careful and cautious about how you live it because you are answerable to your Creator. And you know, even at that though, there might be some that would dismiss a teenage for their doings and say something like, oh, they're just kids, you know. But I want to tell you, that is hardly the attitude of Solomon. He says, you're going to be judged. And Paul wrote, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We're going to answer to God on an individual basis. Mike Ferris will answer. Anita Ferris will answer. And whoever other's name I could name will answer. We'll all answer. But then the last question tonight, uh, do I still have time? Uh, five or six minutes? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> time passes by so quickly, so quickly. But let's just right, right quickly ask the question, what will be the basis of the judgment? And the answer is twofold. And the first thing that I would like to mention is the scriptures, the inspired, authoritative Word of God will be the basis of the judgment. John 12, 48, Jesus said, He that rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. So it, it will be a basis of judgment. And then, secondly tonight, I would like to mention deeds done in our lives will be a basis. Yes, they will be looked at, and they will be considered in the scenario. Revelation 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and books were open. Another book was open, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of the things written in the books on the basis of their works. And so, books of people's lives, records of how they have lived, and whether that living was good or whether it was bad, it doesn't matter the truth about your life and the hidden things of darkness. Well, when that happens, when, when, when the Scripture is, is placed beside the life of the person, and the life of the person is <laughs> looked at, what's going to be the result? Well, you know, one thing I do know, the judgment is going to be just. It's going to be fair. It's going to be righteous. And it's going to be without partiality. Just know that that is the case. There is one last thing I'd like to mention, but I'm just simply going to mention this, not get into it. Those thus judged will either be rewarded in heaven or punished in hell. And you'll remember the, uh, the depiction of the judgment in Matthew 25 that Jesus gave. Uh, he shared that scene and the result of the judgment, and it was in terms of, if you'll remember, separating the goats from the sheep. And so on one hand, you have those who are saved. On the other, you have those who are lost. Jesus' role will be to reward and to sentence. And so I would like to close with this. Today, and I'm talking about as we live right now, Jesus stands at the door and knocks, 
asking for entrance into our hearts. That's now. But on that day, the last day, when he does all these other things that we have mentioned, on that day, he's not going to be asking us entrance. Because he's not going to be on, uh, on our doorstep knocking on our door. But then what he's going to be doing is he's going to be telling us where we will spend the rest of our lives. Something to think about, isn't it? I say that it behooves us to prepare. I don't think that we could have a better, more beautiful picture than of an individual preparing to meet their God, who they will meet. I don't think we could have a more beautiful picture than of a child of God who is ever making sure that he is ready. And so, yes, prepare. Get ready. And then when you get ready, stay ready and not neglect in any way. Because I want to tell you something. Life is too short. And death is too certain. And eternity is too long not to be prudent and wise. Thank you for having me tonight. I appreciate it. I hope that you have gained something. And I hope that as I begin the lesson, I truly do hope that the lesson tonight will help us love Jesus more uh, than we ever did. And realize that from beginning to end, we need him. We need him desperately. Thank you for being here. So there is so much sentiment to tonight. Um, I scanned over my dad's notes with my eyes briefly, and I thought, oh, he may even end early. And I thought, like father, like son. Take every minute you've got. Uh, I also made it a conscious intention to match whatever color shirt my dad wore tonight. I've got plenty. So what are you wearing tonight? I wanted to match my father. It means a lot. Uh, do you see any similarities, at least in spirit? Appreciate you for being here tonight. If it wasn't for my dad, earthly and heavenly father, I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here without that. So out of the estimated one. 3,121 lessons that I've heard my dad present. One message is quite clear. Will give you life if you love it and live by it. And it won't if you don't. Hope you've been motivated to live for God tonight. The invitation for the Lord is always open. Think about this as we have our closing prayer by Matt. He can go ahead and come up on the podium here as I remind you that every topic that we've been lining up leads to the crescendo, which will be presented by Wendell next Wednesday night. Thank you so much for being here.